see. Happy New Year. Hey, Happy New Year. Hey, Joe. Hey, Danny. Uh, Gree, are we waiting on anyone else? Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. Happy New Year. Uh, on today's stated agenda, today is the charter meeting. Uh, typically at charter meetings, we don't usually vote on legislation, but there is a lot going on. So we are voting on a series of bills today, which you'll hear about. Uh, the first are a couple of finance items. Introduction 1226, which will establish the Throgs Neck Business Improvement District in Council Member Jonai's district in the Bronx. And introduction 1227, which will expand the Hudson Square Business Improvement District in my district. Uh, moving on, the council will vote on the following legislation, introduction 1299, sponsored by Councilmember Jamani Williams, will clarify that for the purposes of enforcing prohibitions against unauthorized commuter van services, the definitions of for hire vehicle and commuter van do not include public bus service operating pursuant to a contract with any state or local government. This has been a big issue uh, in the outer boroughs related to people getting to and from airports. It's been around for a while. Councilman Williams is speaking, I think, at the mayor's press conference right now. Uh, but if he arrives, happy to have him talk uh, on this bill. Uh, next, we're going to vote an introduction. 828, sponsored by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, which would require, this sounds a little geeky, but it's important, which would require the Department of Records and Information Services, Doris, to list all of the reports required by local law on its website. So we pass all sorts of reporting bills all the time, but if the press or the public wanted to see what those reporting bills are, right now you can't really find them. So this would require Doris to uh, uh, put those reports on their website, including, here it comes, Councilor Cabrera, talking about the importance of your bill, uh, including relevant information about those reports. Uh, it will also provide the public with access to every past report of the type received by Doris, and if an agency fails to submit uh, a required report on time, which happens a lot, Doris would request the report from the agency and post that request their request they would post on their website in lieu of that report uh, until the agency transmits the report. So the public and the press would see that an agency didn't submit a report, but there would be the letter from Doris saying, we made the request to the agency, and so everyone would know what has come in and what hasn't come in. Finally, this legislation would require that reports uh, be sent to Doris electronically rather than hard copy, which crazily in 2019 is not the case. Uh, so again, I said before you walked in, Fernando, this sounds geeky and wonky, but it's actually very important for the work we do every single day. So I'm going to invite the chair of our Government Operations Committee to come up and talk about this important bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for your support in this, this important uh, bill. And as it was stated, uh, basically we're going to make it a lot easier for the agencies to take those, those four pages to now be sent, four copies, uh, I meant, to be sent now electronically. Uh, second, uh, we will have now the full universe of report uh, to be online. This is really unprecedented. And third, and quickly here, uh, now uh, the public will be notified when there was a report that was supposed to be up and it's not there. Now the public will be able to know that it's not there and essentially send a message to those agencies that they need to send us a report ASAP. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Thanks, Fernando. Thank you. Uh, next, the council is going to vote on introduction 728. This has been in the news a lot. It's sponsored by Councilman Rafael Espinal, which would establish a temporary program for the resolution of outstanding judgments resulting from awning sign violations. Uh, again, you saw what was happening, uh, specifically it was in South Brooklyn where a lot of this was happening, uh, but all over the city. It will also establish a two-year moratorium on the issuance of an additional awning sign violations, as well as an interagency task force to explore issues related to awning signs and education related to bringing existing awning signs into compliance. The bill required the Department of Buildings to provide a report to the council containing information about awning sign violations and establish a waiver of work without a permit penalties <coughs> issued in connection with the awning signs since December 28, 2017 uh, going forward. 
This was, of course, a great concern for business owners across the city, so I'm glad we're voting on this bill today. It's an example of us being responsive to community needs and giving a helping hand to small businesses that are the lifeblood of the city. When Councilor Espinal arrives, I'm happy to have him uh, speak on this, but it's very, very important, and I'm glad we're voting on it today. Uh, finally, and this is a really big deal, the package we're voting on, we're gonna vote on the student transportation oversight package aimed at improving our city's school bus system. This has received a lot of attention, and rightly so, the Daily News did a lot of investigatory work on this. When parents put their children on a school bus, we are the guardians of that child, and we have to take that obligation seriously while we're taking care of them. This past fall, we had a lot of problems that caused a lot of stress to parents, and I'm sorry that that happened. This package is our attempt to help make sure that it doesn't happen again. The primary goal of the package is to keep our children safe, so I'm proud to, of course, support all of these bills. The first bill in this package is Introduction 89, sponsored by Councilmember Andy King. It would require the Department of Education report on the average length of time scheduled for school bus routes in each community school district. The bill would also require the Department of Education to share actual school bus uh, transportation times as recorded by GPS trackers, which Councilmember Kalis will talk about in a moment, uh, with the City Council, they'd have to share that information. Councilmember King can't be here, but he just called and requested that I read his quote, so I'm happy to do that. Uh, his quote, he says, I, as a working adult, have at times become annoyed and frustrated after traveling an hour or more to get to work. Now imagine the frustration of a child age 6, 13, or 17 who has had to endure an hour of travel time and then is expected to function well in the classroom. It's a struggle for a child. This piece of legislation is designed to comprehend the travel times of all of our contracted school buses and bring about a resolution to decrease travel times for the betterment of our children. The bus companies and drivers have a responsibility to our children and to their parents to not leave us wondering why travel time is so long for our children to get to school and to come home. So I wanna congratulate Councilmember King. Sorry he can't be here, uh, but we're gonna be voting on his bill today. Next uh, is gonna be an introduction uh, by Councilmember Dan Drum, introduction 451, the chair of our finance committee. It will require the Department of Education to distribute a school bus ridership guide in hard copy and electronically to all students and parents. This guide would include a description of eligibility for school bus services, what the services entail, information for parents and students living in temporary housing, these are kids, many who are homeless, uh, and students in foster care, and the responsibilities of students and parents using DOE school bus services. So I want to invite uh, the former chair of our education committee and our current finance chair, Danny Drum, to come and speak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to join my colleagues in addressing the concerns uh, with school buses that were highlighted uh, this past fall. Getting students quickly and safely to and from school helps set the tone for the rest of the school day, and empowering families with the relevant information is a critical part of this. Intro 451B will require the DOE to distribute to all students and parents an annual school bus ridership guide, which will include a description of eligibility for school bus services, what the services entail, and the responsibilities of all students and parents using DOE's school bus services. Most notably, the guide will also include information for parents and students living in temporary housing, as the speaker has said, and students in foster care. Finally, to ensure as many of our families as possible are reached, the information will be posted on the DOE's website in English and in the top six languages. Of course, I wanna thank Speaker Johnson for promptly responding to the concerns made apparent after the start of this school year, which we received an unusually high number of complaints. I also wanna acknowledge Chair Traeger and Committee Council Beth Golub and all the advocates and parents who uh, came in to voice their experiences at the hearing. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Danny. Uh, next is introduction 926, uh, which I sponsor. It'll require the Department of Education to share with parents and post on its website how parents can file a complaint about a school bus employee, the process by which the department investigates such a complaint and the possible results of such an investigation. This bill also requires the Department of Education to share the protocols for school bus 
bus services and inclement weather emergencies. And introduction 929, sponsored by Council Member Joe Borelli, would require the Department of Education to report on all of the calls and complaints received from parents and guardians about school bus services, the investigations DOE opened into school bus employees, the number of investigations that were substantiated, and a description of outcomes taken by the Department of Education in the event of a substantiated investigation. So I'm gonna invite Joe up to talk on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for making Charter Day not just a day for uh, self-praise and pats on the back. That's good that we're getting uh, you know, a lot of business done today, and I, I commend you for that. Uh, I just wanna speak uh, briefly about the package of bills. Uh, for too long, frankly, the, the council has not spent uh, as much time and has put enough concern uh, into this portion of education as uh, matched by the concern that parents have. Uh, as a recent parent, I can tell you that one of the scariest things is putting your child in the custody of someone that you, you barely know. Uh, and finally, uh, we have a council that is matching the concern with the level of interest we're putting uh, towards school busing uh, and the problems that school bus riders uh, do face. With respect to my specific bill uh, on, on Staten Island, spe more specifically, uh, we've seen so many children have problems, whether it's, it's crossing the, the sidewalkless swamps or uh, climbing up the, the hills in Councilmember Rose's district. Uh, there just seems to be a, a lot of problems uh, with students accessing uh, the right to take a school bus to and from school. So we're gonna find out why uh, kids are having problems, whether it's with the bus drivers, the company, the matrons, the routes, the school regulations. Uh, we're gonna find out why they're having the problem and what the outcome is uh, and hopefully fix it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Joe. Uh, we're going to vote on two pieces of two pieces of legislation sponsored by Councilmember uh, Kalos. Introduction 1099, and this is a really big one. Will require that every school bus in New York City has to be equipped with a GPS tracking device, and require the Department of Education to give authorized parents and guardians access to the real-time location of their child's school bus whenever it is in use. This bill would also require each bus be equipped with two-way communication devices for allowing communication with the school bus operator. And introduction 1148 would require the Department of Education to report on school bus routes uh, that are determined, uh, goals uh, for uh, time limits for those bus routes and any other goals related to school bus services. This bill would also require the Department of Education sk share school bus routes with parents and guardians at least 15 days before the start of the school year and report a list of school bus vendors uh, who com completed a dry run of their route as required by the contract. Those bus vendors who are not in compliance with their contractual obligations to complete those dry runs. The bill will also require the Department of Education to let parents know uh, on a daily basis if their child's bus is uh, late arriving or departing school. Uh, these are two very important pieces of this package, so I invite Ben up to talk. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. I wanna start by thanking all the parents, advocates, and members of the media who are partners in moving this package forward and helping us build the expertise on what was going on. I wanna thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership on the uh, Student Transportation Oversight Package, the STOP Act, and for moving so much of this and really digging in our education chair, Traeger, uh, for all the work he's done on this, as well as from the city council staff. Uh, Andrea Vasquez was literally negotiating this on New Year's Eve. Uh, also, uh, Ala Mosawai, one of our data analysts, was there proving why uh, we needed to get this done. I'd also like to thank uh, the co-sponsor of this legislation, uh, Council Member Chaim Deutsch. He started working on this back in 2000 under then council member Mike Nelson. I'm proud to be able to stand with him now to get this bill done. Now this was originally drafted by then education committee council Laura Popa and uh, has been updated for today with the help of our current committee council Beth Golub uh, with feedback from our brothers and sisters at ATU 1181, the Teamsters, both of whom are supportive as well as legal support and advice from the law offices of Regina Skyer. I just really wanna thank uh, Laura and Beth for getting this done, and it shows just how long we've been working to get this done. Now, every 
year, the start of school starts with nightmares of children who get stuck on buses for hours, uh, leaving parents worrying about where their children are. And with this tool, we're just saying, and, and listen, we can do this with Uber. The MTA has done this with buses. You can just take your phone and see where that bus is or where that Uber is or even where that yellow cab is. Just wanna say we want parents to be able to track where that school bus is, when it's gonna get there, and where their kid is once it's on there. Uh, this nightmare became a crisis uh, during November storm, winter storm Avery, when buses were literally trapped and stuck on the street for more than 10 hours. We had kids getting home the next day. Uh, in this case, a woman named Jennifer Reynosa reached out to me at 9.30 p.m. to let me know her son, who is receiving a special education, uh, hadn't gotten home yet. We reached out to the mayor's office. They had to literally get the NYPD involved to rescue this child shortly after midnight. We got that child off the bus and in the hands of their parent who was waiting with open arms. But that should never happen again. And I'll, I'll be even more honest. There's a lot of legislation we've done together in the city council. I believe local law one on the campaign finance. This is the first time just walking out the door this morning where as, as a new parent, uh, myself and with my wife, when you, when you see and hear about something happening to a child, all you can do is see your own child in that situation. My wife actually kissed me on the way out the door and said, thank you for getting this done. This is important if we're, when we send our child to public school in a couple of years. And um, I just really am so thankful for it. Now, none of this is new. Uh, the idea of giving people the uh, routes ahead of time is something we lifted from Boston, another small city. Uh, and then there's another city, incidentally, that has GPS and all the buses. Uh, it's down south. Uh, they're building something pretty big there. But uh, the uh, chancellor, incidentally, comes from that city. And they've had GPS there since 2015, and that's Houston. And so we think that if he could do it there in 2015, he should be able to get it done here. And so as the speaker already mentioned, introduction 1099 will put GPSs on every single bus and allow parents to track those buses with their phones. Also let the DOE know where those buses are. And then similarly, introduction 1148 hopes to just stop putting children on the buses that are gonna take forever and just say, let's give it, give those routes two weeks ahead of time, make sure that the parents see the route can flag if there's a problem, bring it to the DOE's attention. And I'm hoping and I'm praying that September next year, we've got the GPSs up and running and parents know what the bus route is and can make sure that their kid does not get trapped on a bus for hours. This is simple, this is straightforward, and all the city needs to do is pick the kids up and deliver them safely to school every day. Thank you. Thanks, Ben, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, lastly, and I don't see him here, our great education chair, uh, Mark Traeger, has introduction uh, 1173. It will require the Department of Education to report on the department's school bus services, including the vendors providing school bus transportation to students, the number of vehicles and employees used by such vendors, the number of school bus routes and transportation sites in use, the number of students using school bus transportation, including the type of students and the categories of students who are eligible for DOE transportation services. This bill would require the Department of Education to report on school bus delays and no-shows. So if our chair of the Education Committee arrives, I'd be happy to have him speak. And Councilor Espinel got here a couple minutes late, so I wanna invite him up to speak on his important legislation on awnings uh, and the moratorium that we're voting on today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am passing a bill today, but my wife did not kiss me on the lips today. Uh, but we are uh, very excited about this. Uh, today marks- She's just your girlfriend. I don't have, sorry, I'm not married either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's before <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Today marks the culmination of nearly two years of hard work and advocacy. I'm grateful to my fellow council members, uh, Council Member Brannon, Ku, Menchaca, Yeager, Holden, and Jonai, and the chair of the Housing Buildings Committee, uh, Council Member Cornegie, and the speaker for all their efforts in pushing this forward, so thank you. We, begin, we began putting together this integral piece of legislation when businesses in my district about two years ago suddenly found themselves with $6,000 fines for signs that they had up in their businesses for years. Since November of 2017, there have been over 2,000 sign violations reported 311 across the five boroughs. 
The fine combined with the price tag of a new sign can be devastating to a business's bottom line. As the sudden uptick in violations came to the awareness of my colleagues, we quickly worked together to institute a two-year moratorium on any sign violations. Businesses will not have to feel the burden of these unjust fines while we work on a comprehensive reform to end this unjust practice. In addition to this moratorium, any small business that has yet to pay these fines will be given complete financial relief. There will be reduced permit fees for hanging new signs and a task force with small business owners, city agencies, and the chambers of commerce to investigate any predatory practices that might be going on and compile strategic reform to prevent this injustice from ever happening again. And again, the, the big problem here was that there were thousands of businesses across the city that were being fined on a daily basis uh, for having these awning uh, signs that they've had for decades. Uh, we, we did some investigation. Uh, there was one person involved in, in these 301 complaints, and we've learned that it was just for him to be able to do more business and be able to uh, hang up more signs across the city. So what was happening uh, was really egregious, and it's something we need to take action to make sure that our small mom pops across the five boroughs have the resources they need to continue doing business in our city. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations. Important. That concludes uh, the agenda for today's uh, stated uh, charter meeting, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. I'm happy to take first any on-topic questions on any of the bills we just discussed, and then we can do off-topic. Yes. Well, I think Councilor Kahlo spoke about this very eloquently, the history of this, how long it's been around. These bills have been kicking around for a long time, some of them. Uh, but what we saw in the storm that occurred earlier this winter was a real crisis that happened across the city, but especially when you had children who were on buses, their parents did not know where they were. Some kids didn't get home until after midnight. They had been on buses for 12 hours. And so, uh, you know, we're always looking to improve, but one of the basic things that any local government has to do is provide adequate transportation services for students. And that's why this bill is so important. Uh, ben said it very well. We want to make sure we get kids to and from school safely, quickly, efficiently, and in a transparent manner for their families. And so I'm glad we're tackling this today. I think it's very important. Ben, did you want to say anything? Okay. Sorry, Russ. Great. Yoav. Okay. Uh, but are, are there bus companies required to pay for this BTM or is that going to be kind of uh, paid for with kind of in a contract by the city? We started working on this in 2014 with the Office of People Transportation when during a storm in 2014, a parent left their kid at the bus stop. The bus still wasn't showing up. They had to get to work. They got to work. The parents had a building service worker reach out to them. They took the day off work, went home to get their kids who never made it to school that day. The kids missed a day of school, then they got sick, so they missed more school. So we've been working with the OPT. In 2017, there was a contract where the GPSs would have been required, and OPT said that they were moving forward with that contract. And then in 2018, when the buses didn't have the GPS on them, we said, what happened? They were like, whoops, that contract didn't move forward. Uh, so this would require that this be a part of it. Uh, the buses, currently there's 10,000 buses, approximately 10,000 buses, 6,000 of those buses have a technology on them called NAVMAM, and uh, they're currently planning at, I believe, the city's expense to put on the additional 4,000 NAVMANs, uh, and so my belief is that if that's what the city wants to do, we'll support as long as it gets done by September. That being said, I, I would just say you can buy a smartphone for like 10, 20, like maybe 50 bucks, and like it could be a lot cheaper, and Uber's done this, and like MTA's done this, and so we can use the NavMens, or we could just literally, and I've offered DOE this before, I will give them $20,000 from my pocket to put a phone in every single bus, and then just put a GPS program on there. There's hundreds of them out there. Uh, I think they can get it done. What, what's the cost if they go with a nav man program? Uh, I believe that the uh, cost, uh, give, me, give me one second. Can you pull up the fiscal impact? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the cost from our fiscal impact is we estimate $3.7 million year one to get the GPSs installed on the 4,000 additional vehicles and then a $1.8 million additional cost moving forward every year. And I think we can get these costs down and expect them to be far lower. 
but that being said, this is a small price to pay to make sure that parents actually know where their children are. So it's gonna be part of future contracts. Uh, I wanna invite Chair Traeger up to speak on his bill in this very important package. Thank you, thank you. Thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. I'll try to be very, very brief because I'm sure you've heard a lot from my colleagues and the speaker already on this topic. But first of all, I think that the package of legislation that we're advancing today uh, on the school transportation, I think is probably the most comprehensive uh, transparency and accountability legislation that we've seen over an area in the DOE uh, ever. Uh, first of all, we're introducing it to the 21st century, I think as my colleague uh, talked about, but it's also an example of effective and responsive government. And I wanna thank, uh, of course, the families, the parents and advocates who really uh, reached out to our offices. Many of us fielded calls during the start of the school year. I also wanna thank the press I wanna thank the press for the very important and, and really powerful coverage that really did help shape this policy as well. Particularly one reporter, I wanna thank, uh, I wanna thank everybody here, but uh, Ben Chapman, I think th did really extensive, great coverage on the issue of, of, of the delays. Um, and we had hearings, we met with families, we met with bus companies, we met with vendors, we met with labor, we met with everyone, uh, with OPT, DOE, you name it. And we really put together I think uh, a very effective package of bills. I wanna thank the speaker and his team because they really uh, supported us every step of the way. And uh, I, ha I have to say, if not for Speaker Johnson, this probably would not have happened here today, quite frankly. Uh, his leadership was very, very paramount in getting this done. And also just wanna point out that many, this is a $1.2 billion industry, school bus industry. And many times we hear the terms that we contract with school bus companies. But our bills go further that we're also gonna get transparency about the vendors that they subcontract with as well. Because many of them subcontract with many vendors. We had very little information about that, that world. So this is, this is about transparency and accountability. Our families deserve nothing less. Thank you, Speaker, for getting this done. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks, thanks Mark. Uh, any other on-topic questions on any of these bills? Going once, going twice. A summer, yeah. The Doris bill. Yes. Um, It's not gonna be in real time. Jeff or Fernando, do you know? Jeff, okay. I mean, we, I mean, I think it's gonna be embarrassing for them if they do see a letter up there that says that the agency's out of compliance. But I'm glad that to start the new year, you asked this question, because I expected you to ask this question about Doris, so thank you. Well, you just saved my day. Yes, Gotham Gazette, it's great. <laughs> Courtney agrees, she used to work there. Um, uh, okay, anything else on topic? Okay, off topic. Oh, go ahead, yes, I just yeah. Had a question yep. about the report uh, or about the uh, the transfer of uh, school bus transportation. Mm -hmm. Were all the reports, you know, uh, in English or were they added on later at some point? The reports that we compile, uh, I think our reports are typically in English, but if folks need help translating, we have translation services where we could help with that. But our reports are in English, and in the past, if people need help with translation, we always wanna make sure that happens. The, the transportation survey that we're doing right now across the city, we're offering the survey, I think, in seven languages. Um, so again, if it's an issue for folks or for parents, uh, we want accessibility, we want transparency, we want it to be usable. Yeah, on the school bus uh, uh, riders guidelines, it's going to be in English and six other languages as well. So when it goes out to parents, it'll be in those languages. The handbook. Yeah. Yes. Any, yes? Just so I wanted to finish up on topic questions oh, before I want it's okay. And any any anything else that's on topic on on these bills? Okay, great. Go ahead. Sorry. And then secondly, you'll be asking to decorate now for the first time and guarantee something. 
Well, on the, on the paid leave that the mayor just announced uh, in the rotunda here at City Hall, I mean, I support uh, paid personal time for workers in New York City, and I look forward to reviewing the mayor's proposal as it makes its way through the legislative process. Uh, there's no commitment or any details yet. We want to hear from all the stakeholders. We want to hear from workers and small business owners. Uh, the council itself has a very generous paid personal time policy uh, that is actually beyond what the mayor's policy that he's proposing today. Uh, Councilman Williams introduced this bill last session, uh, so there was already a council bill that existed. So I'm, I'm happy to see that the mayor supports this conceptually. I support it, but it will go through the legislative process. On the um, health care that was announced yesterday, I believe health care is a human right. I want everyone to have access to comprehensive, culturally sensitive, high quality uh, health care. Um, I think if we can get more health care to folks, that's a good thing. The council's also been looking at this ourselves before the mayor's announcement, and we have some other ideas uh, that we think uh, could do could potentially complement what the mayor announced yesterday. Uh, but again, that will go through the, the budget process because it's a $100 million uh, outlay in funds towards the Health and Hospitals Corporation. And so again, in concept, I support it. I think it's a good thing. But the details on both these things matter. And they will both go through the processes that are important here at the council, both through legislative and budget processes. We'll figure that out when it goes through the process. I mean, I haven't, no details have been shared with me besides um, getting a heads up before the mayor made the announcement yesterday. Uh, but I, uh, no one shared with me any documents, any information, so I can't address that. But we, for the last six months or so, the council itself internally has been looking at what San Francisco did for Healthy San Francisco under Mitch Katz, who's now the head of H&H &H here in New York, uh, what he did uh, almost a decade ago to expand healthcare access, how they got it done. Some of the ways they got it done was uh, people thought were gonna be controversial. They added uh, some different fees, employer fees, to be able to cover some of the costs associated. The mayor's plan that he announced yesterday, just from what I know on the top lines, doesn't do that. It puts more city tax levy money into health and hospitals to provide more primary care uh, services and support uh, for folks who are either undocumented uh, or don't have health insurance through a typical framework of getting health insurance. And so we're gonna look at all those uh, details and uh, we may have uh, a similar or complementary proposal uh, that we think similarly could do good things. Yoav. Was it? Yes, it was reintroduced. It was. Yep. Okay. Um, and on yesterday's announcement, um, do you think it was kind of, uh, it, it was kind of advertised uh, accurately, I guess I would say. Um, doesn't it essentially just um, trying to get more people to sign up for Metro Plus and on the kind of uninsured side, get people rather than going to emergency care, try to get them into preventative Well, I think I saw the mayor's uh, press secretary say yesterday that this is not single payer, this is not universal health care coverage. The only folks that could really do that are, are the federal government, and I don't see that happening with President Trump and a Republican Senate or the state legislature and governor. Uh, in the past, I have supported and I still support uh, the two chairs of the health committees respectively, Gustavo Rivera in the Senate and Dick Gottfried in the Assembly, the New York Health Act, which would create single payer. There's a conversation around the budget, the details around that, how much it would cost, how you would implement it, municipal welfare funds related to health care, all of those things, and we, should have to, we have to have that conversation. But I think they said yesterday this is not that, so that's an important distinction. One of the things you run up against here is the Affordable Care Act doesn't allow for any type of health insurance product for anyone who's undocumented. Um, so you can't craft the policy if the federal government doesn't allow it. 
uh, but we have some ideas on how to potentially further expand access beyond what was announced yesterday, and I look forward to sharing those details in the future. Fair fairs had to go through the budget process that was negotiated. This will go through a budget process that's negotiated. Summer? Uh, the state still has a positive budget gaps mm -hmm. that they're showing in uh, donations to them and funding. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that, that can get some resolved? It needs to be resolved first before it's still going on budget? I mean, it, it, uh, we, we don't have enough time to actually discuss uh, the, the complications and the nuances and the uh, realities that H&H &H has had to face over the last you know, six or seven years. One of the things that they put in their plan initially that um, uh, Dr. Katz's predecessor, uh, Ram Raju, uh, put forward was to increase enrollment on Metro Plus to get more people enrolled, which would be uh, a very ready and consistent revenue stream for H&H. &H. So this in some ways helps get that done if they can get more people to sign up in Metro Health Plus. Um, the, there have been significant changes. They've been renegotiating contracts. They've been trying to cut down on waste. They've been looking at the contracting process as it relates to other than personnel services. They've been doing a lot of things. They got rid of a lot of managerial, non-union positions, uh, which saved a lot of money. And so this is gonna be uh, an ongoing process. I care deeply about the public hospital system. It is the final shreds of a safety net for many New Yorkers, especially undocumented New Yorkers, and and people that don't have health insurance. So I, of course, support ensuring that H&H &H has the money that it needs, but also we have to keep having the conversation about their transformation plan and how we get them in a stable place. But I think Dr. Katz is doing a good job. Danny, did you want to say anything on h, &H? No, just to add a $100 million uh, price tag on this is definitely something chair. that has to go through um, the budget process and through the Finance Committee as well. So as we move through that, we look forward to seeing how uh, the mayor uh, to make that happen, and uh, we'll, we'll go through that process. Right. Yes. The previous health commissioner. The previous speaker? I thought you were top on the speaker for not going further with the portion tax increase, I, so I don't, did you put a city council on I, I don't remember saying that. I was curious okay. if you were planning to plan that change uh, moving forward with any sort of portion tax uh, legislation or being a council member for this. Uh, I uh, have supported um, not the exact portion cap proposal that Mayor Bloomberg and his Board of Health put forward, which was struck down uh, because it had to go through the legislative process. Um, I'm, I, I think we need to ensure that people have access to healthier foods and hopefully not uh, give children soda and sugary beverages. Uh, Councilmember Kalos just passed a happy, healthy meal, uh, a healthy, happy meal uh, bill recently. Uh, and so anything- well, we're, It's pending here. Pending here, so so anything we can do on this, I think, is great. Um, it will go through the legislative process. So I have to have a. Let uh, the, the speaker Johnson. So the when we did the healthy happy meals, he was health chair. He got a hearing for the bill. We faced substantial pushback from uh, a number of uh, national organizations. Uh, what I'm really grateful to. Corey Johnson for is that he actually reached out to the American Beverage Association and actually secured their vital support for the Healthy Happy Meals uh, legislation. And, uh, the, and so we're focusing on the beverages. And so those, that, that legislation, uh, we're trying to get the hearing on, I'll, I'll be very honest. We were looking to do it, I believe in October, and then we had a Legionnaires situation. And so we did the Legionnaires hearing then I, 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 we've, been work, we've been talking about it frequently and I, I believe we'll be moving forward. I support Ben's bill. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney. Can I follow up on that, though? You said the Timber bill will be going through the legislative process. Did you support it, though? Is there any support for the legislative process? 
I, I don't know the details of this bill. Um, this is the first that's it's kind of been raised to me in a while, but traditionally I have supported uh, measures along these lines. Um, and again, I think that we need to do things to disincentivize unhealthy choices. Uh, and so I think the mayor supported uh, the portion cap when he ran for mayor in 2013 as health chair, as Amanda said, I was uh, pretty vocal in my support of doing something along these lines. I haven't looked at the most recent iteration um, of the bill, uh, and I look forward to doing that and, and, and working with uh, our health chair, Mark Levine, on that. Well, I don't control the subways and buses, um, but I think that the city should control the subways and buses. So I think we should have municipal control. I've been out uh, yesterday, I was at the 77th Street R train stop in Bay Ridge. The day before I was in Jackson Heights with Danny Drum, uh, taking, uh, giving surveys out to folks to ask them about their experience on a daily basis, um, what it's like to take the subway and we are compiling those. We've gotten a really good response just in two days. Today I'm gonna to be on Staten Island at the ferry terminal, asking folks about what their experience is, whether it's on the rail on Staten Island or when they come into the city, what their experience is like. So we're, we're gonna compile that information, uh, analyze it, share it with the MTA, and it will inform our proposals moving forward as well. On the fine details of municipal control, this is a conversation that people have raised in the past before. It's one that I think needs to be elevated and I'm gonna keep banging that drum. The exact details on how to get this done, it's complicated, it's not easy. And so I'm gonna put forward a comprehensive detail-oriented plan on how to do that. But for the next 45 days or so, as acting public advocate and a speaker, I wanna keep shining the light on issues that are important to New Yorkers, advocating on those issues. And I think municipal control of the subways is one of those areas uh, to really look at. Uh, Governor Cuomo said yesterday to the Daily News editorial board that he wants to blow the MTA up and really look at the governance of the MTA and how it's structured. I think one way to, to do that is to give control of New York City transit and the tunnels and the bridges back to New York City, break out Long Island Railroad and Metro North, but the exact funding mechanisms and all of the details on how to get that done and the way that would work is something that I will release in the next 60 days. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Happy New Year, thank you. Thank you.